controller? Um, well, they can teach us, but we have to make certain, you know, that they're, you know, teachers rather than pranksters or, you know, kind of bad things, too. So, you know, you have to have, you know, certain criteria, uh, you know, before you start, you know, taking, you know, their word, uh, I guess, you know, uh, you know, taking in, in to account their advice. Um, yeah, you know, so that, you know, kind of, you know, gets into the whole kind of a cult paranormal thing, you know, you know, do you speak to these entities, you know, do you ask them questions, do you follow their advice, um, you know, how much, uh, you know, do you, do you pay attention to them? Yeah, and, you know, that's a whole different kettle of fish. You, you know, within, uh, you know, the biblical or, you know, the Jewish or, the, you know, the Christian, uh, you know, worldviews, you know, there are angels and, you know, there are demons. You know, you have to be, you know, fairly sophisticated spiritually to be able, you know, to distinguish, um, like, among spiritual entities as, you know, to their nature and, you know, to their veracity and, you know, to their trustworthiness. You know, what their so, intent is. You have and, to and, know what their intent is. Um, well, yeah, well, and, and, you know, you also have to be able, to, you know, to discern within yourself your reaction, you know, to them. Uh, you know, like, do you trust them or, you know, do you not? Wow. Um, changing the top topic just a little bit. Sorry about that. Um, here's another email uh, question that we have from a listener. Uh, P in Wisconsin writes, Dear Dr. Strassman, I have panic attacks after smoking DMT. Um, why do you think this is, and is it due to a dosage problem or a state of mind? And is this a normal reaction that you experienced with any of your volunteers in your study? Yeah, yeah. One of our earliest volunteers that we overdosed on with, with DMT, and, you know, we subsequently lowered the dose after, you know, his experience. So he had, you know, some panic attacks after his, you know, big DMT experience. You know, those resolved uh, over time, and he continued in the DMT study and, you know, kind of, you know, worked it through um, and, you know, didn't have any panic attacks after that. Do you think that could be a result of the vasopressin or other uh, hormones that are released um uh, while you're doing it? Well, I think it's, it's you know, more of a result of, you know, the psychological trauma of, you know, just an overwhelming experience. You know, oftentimes, you know, panic attacks that are not, you know, drug-related um, can begin in response, you know, to some kind of, you know, psychological, you know, kind of trauma, uh, like a car accident or, you know, being injured or, you know, being mugged, those kinds of things. In a comparable sort of way, I think that the psychological trauma that can come about from an unexpected DMT uh, experience also, especially in somebody who might be biologically or psychologically, you know, prone to anxiety, uh, you know, to develop, you know, panic attacks, uh, you know, thereafter. What were what was some of the most profound experiences that your subjects um, reported? And, um, what was some of the heaviest doses that you injected, and what was the results of those? Yeah, um, well, um, actually, the first couple of people, you know, that we gave DMT to, we gave it intramuscularly, and, you know, that was just a bit too slow and wasn't as intense as the smoked effect. And, you know, because our studies were being, you know, funded by the National Institute on, on you know, drug abuse, um, I was, you know, uh, kind of keen on, you know, reproducing uh, the time course and the in intensity that people were reporting when they were smoking it in the field. You know, so then we switched over, you know, to giving it intravenously. And we gave people, well, we gave, you know, two people, you know, too high uh, a dose of intravenous DMT. That was 0 0.6 milligrams per kilogram. You know, so we ended up, you know, giving, you know, the rest of the volunteers as uh, the high dose, you know, 0 0.4 you know, milligrams per kilogram of intravenous DMT. And also this was DMT fumarate. It was a, you know, water-soluble salt of DMT. Most of the time what's smoked on the street is the free base of DMT, you know, so that isn't quite comparable on a milligram per milligram, you know, basis to the fumarate salt of DMT that we were giving. Um, our small doses of DMT were 0 0.05 milligrams per kilogram and 0 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. And also we gave a couple of intermediate doses, you know, 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 milligrams per kilogram. Um, yeah, well, the, you know, uh, the most profound experiences, 
You know, I suppose it just depends on what you mean by profound. You know, some people had, you know, deep psychological healing uh, in response to, you know, some of the bigger doses of DMT, you know, without, you know, much in, uh, you know, the way of, you know, visions or spiritual effects. You know, some people had spiritual enlightenment, you know, kinds of experiences, uh, you know, merging into the white light, you know, being reborn. People had entity contact with outer space beings and, you know, communicated with them and helped them out. So there's a whole, you know, gamut of um, incredibly moving uh, and, you know, profound responses, you know, that people had. You have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, yes. We've read uh, The Spirit Molecule several times, but I do see a, a, one that we haven't read yet, Inner Paths to Outer Space. Can you tell us a little bit about the context of that? Yeah, yeah, that came out, I guess, about a year and a half ago now. Um, it was the brainstorm of, you know, the second author, uh, who is a hematologist oncology researcher for Big Pharma, um, who's also a um, science fiction illustrator and writer and, you know, big time enthusiast. Um, so, and, you know, so he, you know, contacted me after, you know, reading, you know, the DMT book and was quite keen on, you know, getting the sci-fi community up to speed with our DMT work because of, you know, his belief um, that quite a bit of the material in the DMT book would be of interest to these, you know, science, uh, you know, fiction reading uh, community out there. You know, so um, it was his idea, and he asked me if I'd be interested, and I said, for sure. And, you know, then I asked, you know, Luis Eduardo Luna, um, who's an anthropologist with a huge amount of ayahuasca experience, if he would come on board as well. Um, So he agreed. And, you know, then he asked his friend, Edie Frexa, who's a Hungarian psychiatrist with all kinds of great ideas about, you know, quantum mind and non-locality, those kinds of things. Uh, You know, so he did, too. So the four of us collaborated. Um, Each of us contributes three to four different chapters. Um, You know, so... Um, I would say it's an elaboration and an explication of kind of the other world's idea, you know, the beings out there, you know, where do they uh, reside, you know, what's the nature of, you know, the information in those states, um, like how, you know, can we understand it, you know, f- you know, from the point of view of both anthropology and, you know, um, uh, brain chemistry, you know, quantum theory, um, you know, so we kind of expand on, you know, that, you know, particular, you know, theme, you know, that came out in the DMT book. And uh, what are you working on currently? Is there any new books in the process? Yeah, I'm working on a book about uh, Old Testament prophecy and um, endogenous, you know, psychedelics, um, which is, you know, going to be kind of a hard sell. But, uh, you know, I've been studying the Old Testament for 15 years, um, you know, thereabouts, you know, um, you know, since completing the DMT work, uh, you know, I couldn't quite, you know, f- you know, feel satisfied with the kinds of, you know, models that I had approached, you know, the DMT study with in the first place. You know, the Buddhist or you know, the, uh, the brain chemistry, or uh, you know, the psychodynamics, you know, psychoanalytic. So I started looking for, you know, models of spirituality that were more relational, you know, that kind of, you know, held, you know, to the idea, uh, you know, that the spiritual realms exist and, you know, they're external to us, you know, rather than internal to us. Um, and, you know, the Old Testament model um, is, you know, that kind of model. It's, you know, I'm like a relational model of spirituality. And you know, the, and you know, the highest state of spiritual attainment in the Old Testament is you know the prophetic state. Um, you know, uh, there's all you know kinds of visions and out of body experiences and you know and you know contact with beings and uh, you know all all you know manner of you know psychedelic you know phenomena. Well, um, the Guardian, the Guardian in, in the UK released an article last year about um, the possibility of Moses being uh, under the influence of some sort of psychedelic whenever he wrote the Ten Commandments. I I think they mentioned ayahuasca by name. And they mentioned ayahuasca by name uh, in relation to acacia trees. Um, Yeah, the burning bush, you know, might have been an acacia tree. Well, yeah, um, a a scholarly colleague um, of mine in Israel uh, uh, wrote an article. Uh, Yeah, yeah, and, you know, so that's what the U.K. article was about. Well, so his name is, you know, Benny Shannon. Shannon. Um, yeah, and you know, um, so he's at the Hebrew University in, in Jerusalem. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, 